My dear brothers and sisters, blessed and happy Sabbath day. I am very, very happy to be here again in Canada, here in the Bloor Street Church. It's great to be here. I think my wife and I came about two years ago, and now I come alone. But my wife, please, she said, please give greetings to everyone here in Canada. Also, my son gives special greetings. She was not able to come to the East Coast, to Canada. We have some relatives. My wife found her lost cousin. The, the, the cousin's been looking for my wife for over 30 years. And through Facebook, they made contact. So she's spending some time at our house. And they're having a, a great time in California. Well, California, as you know, doesn't have much rain. For about four years now, we've had a drought. And so please send a little bit of rain to California. I'll even pay you a little bit for every day that you send it. Sunday will be my departure date. I will be leaving just, uh, I will have a quick meal. Then I have to go to the airport and I'm flying to Atlanta, Georgia. We're going to have an American Union conference there. So we'll have a delicate session and then we have public meetings from Wednesday night through Sabbath. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, we are definitely living in the last days and the shocking things that are happening today. Uh, we have this financial unrest, this, this sickening immorality, the new world order that is slowly being formed today, unprecedented military exercises. Now, I found a few headlines. Stock market panic in China. Here's another one. Oregon, that's the state of Oregon, north of California. Oregon allows 15-year-olds to have state-subsidized sex changes without parental consent. Shocking, right? As we all know, uh, the federal government, the Supreme Court made the decision of same-sex marriages. So a lot of people said, well, it doesn't bother me. I'm happily married. But it's moving in the wrong direction, especially in the United States of America. The United States is changing very, very rapidly. And God's messenger says that the last movements will be rapid. So in, in the month of September, as you are well aware, the Pope of Rome will be coming, be speaking to President Obama. He will have a private audience. Then the following day, he will be speaking to Congress, to both houses, and this will be an, an historic event. And then he will also be going to Maryland talking about what? The family. How can we unite the family? Well, the fathers need to be home on Sunday. Sounds good. But there's a long-range objective to bring about a Sunday what? Sunday law. Whether we believe it or not, the Bible forecasts a, spe a special law that will hurt God's people. So I think we need to prepare ourselves. Another one, Pope calls for new world order. These are just some of the headlines, uh, the unprecedented violence that we're, we're seeing in the United States and perhaps also in Canada as well. Jesus in the sanctuary. That is my title. I would like to talk about Jesus. My focus is on Jesus, the Messiah, our deliverer, our friend. He's my personal friend, and he is with us today. And I'm so happy that so many of us have come here. There's a lot of old friends. I've known some of you for at least 40 years. Yes, Brother Timo, 40 years it's been, or more than that. I came to Canada in 1975, and I lived here until 1978. So, but there's a lot of unfamiliar faces, little children growing up. You're certainly welcome in, in the house of the Lord. And I hope this meeting will be a blessing. I will share with you many Bible texts, and I hope these Bible texts will hit home. Let God speak to you. Not that I'm going to speak to you. God must speak to you through his Holy Spirit. Some years ago, a young man, his name was Charles G. Finney. He was sitting in a law office in New York City one morning. He was all alone. And he somehow heard a voice. And the voice more or less said, Finney, what are you going to do when you finish your schooling? I want to become an attorney. Why? Finney says, I'll put, put out my shingles. 
I'm going to practice law. Then what? Well, I'm going to build a big house, a beautiful home, a big mansion, and have a, a wonderful family. What next, Finney? Well, I'm going to grow old. I'm going to retire. Then what, Finney? Well, I'm going to die. And then what? The judgment. The judgment. Finney recalled a Bible text from childhood. And this was the Bible text. What does the Bible say? It is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, what? The judgment. That's, that's crystal clear. It is appointed unto men once to die, and afterwards, they say, the judgment. So he contemplated this, this thought about the judgment to come, and he gave his life to Jesus. He surrendered his heart, and a profound change took place in Finney's life. It changed. Do you realize that you too must face the judgment? You can't escape that fact. It's, Paul writes, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. All of us here, each one of us here, I don't know how many people are present, 130 people, 140, 150, each one of us will give an account to God. No one is going to be overlooked in this judgment. No one is going to be exempt from the judgment. And it's going to be God that's going to judge you, not your fellow man. Think for a moment. Your whole life, everything that you have done, all the 50 years, 60 years, 30 years of your life will be reviewed before the universe, this massive universe that has no end. And everyone will know who you really are. Okay? <laughs> who you really are. Does that make does that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable? That the whole universe is going to find out who you really are? Or perhaps you're afraid of the judgment. If so, there's something that you can do. It's not too late. Prepare now. When does this judgment take place? Well, there's one judgment that precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ. It determines whether you will be saved or whether you will be what? Lost. No, wait a minute, wait a minute here, you're saying. <laughs> I thought the judgment takes place after Christ's coming. Well, let me explain. The judgment has three phases. The first phase is called the investigative judgment, and that pertains to all who have professed to be followers of Christ. And it determines whether the, your name will be in the Book of Life, a very special book. Then we have the second phase of the judgment. That takes place during the millennium. Revelation chapter 20 talks about a thousand years of judgment. And who is going to be, who's going to be judged? All the bad people, all the unrighteous. The good, the righteous, they will be in heaven. Millions of righteous people, and they will investigate. They will look at the books to determine a sentence upon the wicked. And it's also the third phase. There is the execution that takes place during the, the, this phase. Revelation chapter 20. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's, it's crystal clear. Fire comes down. There's the execution, the execution stage, the lake of fire. Now, I'd like to focus this morning upon the judgment that precedes the second coming of Jesus. And these deliberations, the court scenes, began in 1844. How do I know? According to Daniel, chapter 8, chapter 9. Exactly, 1844. At this moment, what, what's today's date? It's the 1st of August. It's Sabbath. There's a judgment that's going on right now. But you can't see it. By faith, we believe that. And there's a last message that is being proclaimed to the whole world, all continents, every city. Fear God 
and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come not will come is come it's now in session if the judgment began in 1844 and today is 2015 put your thinking caps on all the mathematicians how many how many years how many years has this judgment been going on a hundred years 120 years 150 years quickly tell me you don't know well i know it's written down 171 years that's a long time noah preached how many years 120 years and then the water came from the heavens from below destroyed the world god is giving us mercy to prepare ourselves for his coming and there's a judge there's a jury there's witnesses everything is taking place systematically books are being opened to determine whether we will be saved when christ comes come with me let's review the heavenly court scene i beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him thousands thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the judgment was set and what was opened the books were opened that's a scene that's the scene here we see god the judge sitting upon his throne and before him are thousands and thousands of angelic beings they are witnesses in today's earthly courts of justice sometimes mistakes are made not in the heavenly court there will be no mistakes but on earth a fact may be omitted a fact may be uh, distorted the jury is biased what would result an unfair trial in which an innocent man is convicted of a crime he didn't commit or a guilty woman is set free this will not happen when god does the final judging his ways are righteous and perfect this year i found on the internet a short article what does it say here after 37 years in prison innocent north Carolina, Carolina man freed in the United States. Carolina, 37 years he spent in prison. He was totally innocent. His name is Joseph Sledge. He is now 70 years old. He's been released from federal penitentiary. It says here in this, in this statement, three judges listened to closing arguments Friday about how Sledge was wrongfully convicted in the 1976 stabbing deaths of a mother and her adult daughter court clerks discovered a misplaced envelope of evidence while cleaning out a high shelf of a vault the envelope contained hair found on the victim and believed to be the attackers megan clement forensic said none of the evidence collected from the scene hair dna and fingerprints belong to joseph sledge just a few more thoughts the victim 74 year old josephine davis and her 57 year old daughter eileen were stabbed to death in september 1976. sledge was convicted of two counts of second degree murder and sentenced to life in prison after his release sledge was headed to savannah georgia to live with family he told reporters he never doubted he'd be freed someday yeah, after 37 years almost 40 years i have confidence in my own self the self-will and the patience he said before trailing off and searching for the right word patience is the word problem problem <laughs> serious problem man was was put in behind bars for 37 years not three months three years 37 years but this is not going to happen there'll be no faults in 
in the investigative judgment that's taking place today, since the year 1844. In the Bible, we read on. There it is, there's Sledge, Joseph Sledge. That's the man that was released after 37 years. Now, the Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 12, the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So the book of life, it's one of the books that, that are in heaven. It is absolutely necessary that our name appears in the book of life to be saved. Anyone who accepts Jesus Christ as his personal savior has his name entered in this special book in heaven. However, there is the possibility that your name could be removed, it could be blotted out. If the Bible does not teach once saved, always saved, as many churches teach. No, you can backslide. I've, many, I've known many Christians, they started out racing, hallelujah, praise the Lord, active in church activities, and then comes the backsliding. And sometimes I wonder, what causes this, the backsliding? Well, sometimes the church is maybe too behavior-centered rather than Christ-centered. And of course, people don't study the Bible. I hope you study the Bible, right? at least once a day. I hope you pray at least once a day. I hope you witness the people. If you don't do those things, you're going to go, back, you're going to go backwards. Guaranteed. You don't study, you don't pray, you don't reach out, you're not going to heaven. It's impossible. You need a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about today. So your name can be removed. You can fall away from grace if you are not faithful unto what? Until the end. And that's a battle. I grew up in this church, in this faith. You think it's easy sometimes fighting against the devil? It's, it's tough. There's burdens. And Jesus says, come unto me if you're weary, you're tired, and I will give you rest. He says, come to me. He doesn't say, come to the church, come to the truth, come to a minister. Come to me, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He that overcometh, wrote John, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. You overcome your personal sins. Your name will remain in the book of life. Now, the investigative judgment began with the first name in the book. First name. Who, 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 who's the first one that was investigated? From, who, who was the first person? Adam, Eve, who, who was the first person? Hmm. Abel. <laughs> Abel, not Adam, not Eve. It started with those who died, and it goes on to the living, according to Adventist teaching. Abel was the first person. His name, next to his name was written pardon. He was a sinner. He repented. He confessed his sin. His name remains in the book of life. What about David? Oh, what did he do? Some bad things, didn't he? Premeditated murder. Hmm. Adultery. Open. Was he? What about her? his name? His name remains. Why? Because he repented of his sins. He confessed the sins. So simple. God doesn't make things complicated. You go to him. Lord, have mercy upon me. Help me. Forgive me. Simple as that. Nothing complicated. Go to God and say, Lord, help me in my personal life. I'm struggling. Help me to overcome. Please forgive me. Many centuries later, Judas Iscariot, he was a follower of Jesus, one of the 12 disciples. But Judas lost his place in the book of life because he sold his master for 30 pieces of silver. How sad, how terrible to have your name removed from such an important record. You're no longer eligible for eternal life. You're doomed to eternal death. 
One of these days, very soon, my name will be called in heaven. If you believe in Christ, your case too will be considered. Have you repented of all of your sins? And ask Jesus to forgive you. Now I have a question to all of you right now. Just a few questions. We have the Woodbridge Church here, Vancouver Church that is represented, Toronto, Dundas Hamilton Church, and so on. Okay? Now, how many of you are members of the church and your name is in a, in a document, in a book? Can, can they see your hands? Any more? Raise them, raise them high. That your, your name is written. OK, wonderful. Thank you. You see all of this? So some of you have not raised your now. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Those of you who raised your hands. Is your name in the book of life? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Whoa. Wonderful. You, I can't believe it. I thought maybe two or three people would raise their hand. Yes. Your name is in the book of life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We shouldn't have any doubt. Is my name in the book of I'm not so sure. You know, we must be sure 100% having no doubts. Do you believe that Christ has forgiven you all of your sins? Yes, I hope so. That you will have salvation. You, you will go to heaven someday. Somebody comes and says, Brother, are you saved? Well, I, I, I don't know about that. That's in the future. You can say with, with authority, with conviction, I am saved today. Yes, amen. And we can say we don't know about tomorrow, but today, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you've confessed your sins, you believe in him, you are saved at that moment. Of course, we have to fight the battles until the very end. We can be saved every day, every day. Every day we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Malachi speaks about another book. Speaks of another heavenly volume, book of Rome. Then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. What is the book called? The books are open. The book of remembrance. Okay. Great controversy. What's found in this book of remembrance? Every, every temptation resisted. Every evil overcome. Every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled. Everything. All the good deeds that you have done. And we've all done some good deeds, haven't we? Everything is there. Tender pity. Going to a funeral. Speaking to somebody. Giving somebody hope. Visiting a poor, poor widow. Giving food. Supplying her needs. There's so much that can be done. It's all written in the book of remembrance. All of these good deeds that we have done. Every time we yield to temptation, there's another book. <laughs> Our sin is accurately recorded in the book of sin. Psalm 51, verse 1 and 9. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Hide thy face from my sins. And blot out all my iniquities. God blots out all of the iniquities, all of the selfishness, the pride, the vanity, the worldliness. If we confess, yes, they're written in that book, the book of sin. Holy angels, they watch every wayward act. And they not only record the visible actions, but our deepest thoughts. God looks into our hearts. I don't have that ability to look into your heart. I don't know what goes on in your heart, the struggles, the pain that you have, the convictions that you have, the doubts that you have, the conflicts. I cannot look into your heart, but God who made you can look into the depths of your hearts. Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, Jesus clearly said, had committed adultery with her already, where? In his heart. Should I ask you a question? 
a very hard question, not to embarrass you. How many have committed adultery? Raise the hands. Oh, wow, a lot of holy people here. A lot of holy people. Did you raise your hand? He you didn't raise his hand either. <laughs> He's the leader. All right, one of the leaders. Everybody has broken the Ten Commandments. Everybody's broken which commandment? The Seventh Commandment. Yeah, physically, mentally. Those of you who have not raised him, of course, it's a little embarrassing. I'm an adult. I committed adultery. You've broken that commandment. And your brother, right there, the blue shirt, you're a murderer. Don't you laugh. You're a murderer. If you have hate, have you ever hatred toward a brother or sister? No. Maybe temporarily, for a few minutes, you hated somebody. Oh, cut me off oh, on a freeway. Who? This rage that exists in our hearts. We've broken all ten commandments, dear brothers and sisters. Not just nine commandments, all the commands. And sometimes we've committed adultery in our hearts. Whoa, look at this beautiful girl. <gasps> look at the shape of this girl. Look at the face. Look at the, oh, boy, I sure would like to go with this one. But I'm married. <laughs> you know, things happen in our minds that I can't read. I may be walking down with John Formosa. We walk down, down the street, and John is thinking in a good way. Maybe I'm thinking in a wrong way. You know, looking at the girls, that's sin, isn't it? I think your eyes need to be focused on Jesus Christ. We cannot fool or deceive God. <clears throat> I read in a great controversy, sin may be concealed, wrote an inspired author. It may be denied, covered up from father, mother, wife, children, and associates, and the minister. No one but the guilty actors may cherish the least suspicion of the wrong, but it is laid bare before the intelligences of heaven. The darkness of the darkest night, the secrecy of all deceptive acts, is not sufficient to veil one thought from the knowledge of the eternal. So you can hide things. I've done that also. <laughs> when I lived in New York City, I went to the drag strip, came back to you know, racing cars, Nice big trophy like this. Dad didn't know. I covered it up. I said to my friend, take it, take it. <laughs> I don't want Dad to know about that. I covered it up. Happens, we cover things up, but God saw me racing. God saw me with this big trophy I came back with. We cannot fool God. We can fool family members. Your spouse, you can fool. Right? Your children, the church members. Yes, yes, minister. But... But you cannot fool God. God is always looking. God has constantly his telescope, his video camera on you. 24 hours, he goes into the depths of our hearts. And someday it's going to be revealed. But if we confess our sins, we repent, all of those sins will be taken and cast into the depths of the sea. No longer remembered. You'll never know what I've done in New York City, okay? And what you have done in your country of El Salvador, or Colombia, or Canada, or wherever you came from, Jamaica. Nobody will know. Long before Solomon written something, God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Every secret thing. So he's emphasizing what I just said. Now, by what standard will each of us be judged? Now, James writes something. So speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Who are going to be judged by God's law? And what is man doing today? Trying to destroy God's law. There is no God. God doesn't exist. We don't, there is no right or wrong. Everything is relative. Do away with God's law. But God says you're going to be judged by the law of liberty. The Ten Commandments. What a marvelous promise. I like this Bible text. It's very comforting. We've read it many times in church or at home. First John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a wonderful promise that is extended to each one of us only if, that, that's a big word, if. I should have enlarged the fonts. Big if. If you only confess. If you confess, he's faithful. 
He's not unfaithful. He will what? Forgive us all of our sins. And not only does he forgive us, he cleanses us from all impurity. That's a wonderful savior. Many, many years ago, a man who was a slave trader, his name was, what was his name? John, Captain John. He was traveling across the, traveling upward from Africa all the way to England. He was a captain, John Newton. And he was traveling, and he, he knew that sometimes it would be very dangerous in the Atlantic Ocean. Many battles have been fought on the ocean against the elements. Since the age of 11, he traveled with his father. And one evening, storm clouds appeared. The sky darkened. There was thunder. There was lightning. The boat was being rocked back and forth. The waves were going over into the boat, being hit along the sides of the boat. It was fearful. Even for those who had experienced, they screamed out in great fear. It was pandemonium. And John Newton, a hard-hearted infidel, a slave trader, taking these, the human cargo to, to England, he was afraid. He said, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon me. Remember, an infidel. Something strange happened. Mysterious happened. The storm gradually abated. The winds died down. The sea became calm. A brilliant moon came out. The stars came out. John Newton was amazed by God's grace and his undeserved mercy. His whole life was turned around at the miracle at sea. He saw a miracle. He was ready to perish in the icy waters of the Atlantic, but he reached out to God. Have mercy upon me. And I think some of us, sometimes we go through hard times, some terrible storms, financial storms, marital storms, church problems, and so personal problems, money, whatever it may be, problems that we have. We reach out to God, the storm becomes quiet. We become at peace with God. John Newton became a minister of the gospel, pastor in England, and he wrote a wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, you're familiar with that. I think we'll sing that song later. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yes, like Henry Deering. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. A miracle took place in John Newton's heart, but he had to go through that storm a physical storm, and he recognized there is a God who takes care of me and protects me. It was a terrible storm that he, that he encountered. He's never witnessed anything like that. Amazing Grace story is not only for John Newton, it's your story, it's my story. God's grace reaches down to all of us. We're all lost in the bondage of sin, aren't we? Jesus loves you more than you possibly can imagine. Whatever the sins of your past life, his grace, his love is sufficient to pardon you. I believe that. You may be very, very, very weak, but Jesus is very, very, very strong. You may be guilty, but Jesus is righteous. You may be imperfect, but Jesus is perfect. You may deserve eternal death, but through his grace, Jesus offers you eternal life. Salvation is a gift, isn't it? It's a total gift. We can't earn salvation. That's impossible. We don't deserve it. By his grace, we are forgiven of every sin that we've committed. By his grace, we are free from guilt. Sometimes people have to be admitted in mental asylums because of guilt. 
guilty feelings. You know, I don't feel I don't feel right when I feel guilty and I have to do something. Rare cups, my wife. I'm sorry. <laughs> Please forgive me. <sighs> yes, I, of course. I love you. I care for you. I feel wonderful. I can sleep that 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 night. By his grace, we are free from guilt. We have peace. Grace is greater than sin. Amen, amen, and amen. And grace changes us to transform us, transforms us every day. Grace saves us. God's grace is just amazing. I can't even comprehend it. Grace is not well understood today in the 21st century. Grace shocks us in what God offers us. No one is too bad to be saved. Everyone can be saved if they accept God's grace. God is a specialist. He's a specialist in saving bad people. Any good people here? Mm -mm. You're, I hope you're bad. And I'm bad. Then God can reach out to you. If you say, I'm good, then you don't need Jesus Christ, do you? I'm bad. I'm unrighteous. In the book of Romans, there's, there's John Newton, a picture of him. Where the wages of sin is death. That's what you deserve. All of us. No exemptions. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God gives you a gift. I like, I, I like to receive gifts from time to time. Uh, I think somebody gave me this as a gift. Yeah, I had another one, a blue tie. It was another gift. Of course, I buy things. My wife is, goes to does the shopping. But from time to time, a little gift that we receive. God is love. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Well, somebody would say, I will go to South America by the Amazon. There are many tribes there. And I will spend six months I will, in this malaria-infested area where there's crocodiles, where there's no showers, nothing, polluted water. And then God will love me more. Yes? Uh-uh. No, 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 no. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to make God love you more, or nothing you can do to make, make, make God love you less, equally. And we need God's grace. Grace makes us equal to everyone. I'm not going to be saved of all of my missionary activities. You know, I've done a little bit of traveling. I can't say, Lord, Look at all the years I've, I've worked for you. I'm entitled to salvation because of what I have done. It doesn't work that way. I've done these things because of God's grace, because loving him, having a relationship with him. We get things backwards, thinking we have to work, work, work. Look, Lord, I've kept the commandments. I'm not saying we shouldn't keep the commandments. Am I saying that? I don't think so. No, no. Keep the commandments. If you love me, keep the commandments. But keeping the commandments is a, a, an inward reaction to God's love. It's a response to God's love, God's grace. Grace gives us a second chance. For some of us, maybe a, this is the 99th chance that God has given you. Jonah, the Bible says... He went in the opposite direction. God said, you go to Nineveh. No, no, no. It's too dangerous. I'm going in the opposite. I'm going to Tarshish. He took the boat, but then he, the whale swallowed him, spewed him out, and then God gave him what? A second chance. Isn't that nice that God gives you a second chance? You know, that sometimes we don't give a second chance to a brother or a sister. We don't give the chance... We need to give chances to individuals. Paul, his name was Saul. What did he do? He was a, he was a, a bad person. He went after the Christians, killed them all. God gave him another chance. And on the Damascus Road, he found Jesus as his personal Savior. God gave him another chance. I like the story in Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son also. God gave him a chance. This boy came back home all of us. Jesus is our advocate today. He gives you another chance. Grace was offered on Calvary. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts like a mighty Niagara Falls. 60, 600,000 gallons a second go over the falls. God's love is like that. 
The law, of course, condemns us. But God has dropped all charges against you. He's declared you acquitted, forgiven. That's the gospel message I want to present. God's love and grace has forgiven me. Did you hear the story of a husband who took out a full page newspaper ad to get his wife to forgive him? Full page. Here's what he wrote. A full, full page in Florida. It was in Jacksonville, Florida. He said, he wrote these words. It was printed. Please believe the words in my letter. They are true and from my heart. I can only hope you will give me the chance to prove my unending love for you. Life without you is empty and meaningless. Signed, Larry. Not Watts, Larry Watts. $17,000 he paid for this big ad. (laughs) And before he placed that ad, he sent his wife five dozen roses. It didn't work, no success. And his wife, Mariana, (laughs) moved back with mom and dad. You know, sometimes when there's a little split. Well, Larry tried to visit mom and dad where Mariana was. It was a gated community. They wouldn't let Larry in. Larry tried to call her on a cell phone. Tried over and over. Mariana changed her cell phone number. (laughs) Now the last chance. The newspaper, (laughs) $17,000, took out. A relative told Larry that Mariana saw the advertisement, and she cried. (laughs) No response from her. People have been calling in the newspaper. (laughs) Have they worked it out? Have they worked it out? (laughs) I don't know. I hope so, the director of the newspaper company said. That's something, $17,000, a letter for forgiveness. Our forgiveness didn't cost us $17,000. Not one dollar, but it cost God the entire treasury in heaven. One gift, one substantial, meaningful gift, that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ dropped all charges against us. Christ died for the ungodly. God has provided salvation for the entire race, seven billion people. Everyone has the same opportunity to be saved, no matter where you live, North America, South America, Asia, Africa, makes no difference. Everyone can have salvation, and it all boils down to the cross. The cross offers hope. God's gift of salvation can only be received, not earned. Who's the richest man on planet Earth? lives in the United States. What? Bill. Bill what? Bill Gates. I checked what his assets are worth. That March 2013, $67 billion. That's more than I have. Now, today, July, he increased it to $78 billion. What is that? $11 billion more in two years' time. A lot of money. Suppose now Bill Gates writes each one of us a check, and you receive that check in the mail. It's a good check. You have that check in your hand. Are you rich? You have this check. It says one million dollars. Are you rich? Hmm? (laughs) Not until you sign the check. And, and go on, the Deposit what the check? Where in the bank? You have to do something. You're not rich. You get that check. Oh, suppose you do get the check and Bill forgot to sign his name. Hmm. Won't be accepted. God has sent you a check for more than a million dollars. Much more. Let's see if I have that check with me. There it is. Here it is. It wasn't an it's handwritten. What does it say here? What does it say? John, step up. What does it say? <clears throat> Eternal. Eternal life check. What's the date? August 1st, 2015. What's the name? Name, Henry Deering. Oh, I, I got my check. Signed by God in what? Red letter. Blood what, of what, Jesus. What does that mean? Blood of Jesus. Paid? In full on Calvary. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. That's a check. I, I, I also have a few more checks with John's name. Give me your name afterwards, email address. We'll send it to you. It's a check that God wants to give to you. Signed in blood. 
okay, on Calvary. You know, that this, there's a lot of things that have been written in ink and pencil, but this one has been signed on Calvary, on the cross, in blood. The check for every person, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Protestant, Buddhist, Hindu, I don't care how you dress, God is offering you a check, right? You know, everybody's dressed differently here. That's fine. I'm happy you came. You want to serve the Lord. You want to find salvation through Jesus Christ. That's come as you are. You know, oh, he's a drunk. You know, <laughs> he drank last night. Come in, come in. All kinds of prostitutes, harlots. You're going to forbid them to come into the church if they come in, you know, quietly, reverently. You're going to say, no, no, you're a prostitute. You go down the street. Go to this hotel. You're not welcome. Get out. Get out. <gasps> and the way you are dressed now, <laughs> terrible. I was in Estonia years ago with Leila McTavish and had two translators. One translator, bright red. Sister, Andy, stand up, stand up. The girl was like this in red. Oh, red. Mini skirt. Mini skirt. She was my translator. I gave her a dollar every night. And then, you know, she disappeared, but I, I needed a translator. And she was the one that helped me to reach out to hundreds and hundreds of people that came. So let the people come into the church. God is going to change them, correct? Don't you try to change a person because you can't do it. I can't change my wife. She can't change me either. But God can change me. That little voice, I hear that little voice from God. Henry Deering. That's not right. That's right, Lord. I, that's not right, my actions. Cash, don't reject God's check. Don't just look at the check. Touch the check. Cash the check. God's bank, right? Now also, oh, we're running out of time, anyway. By faith, go into the most holy. That's where Jesus is today, during this investigative investigative judgment. Your sins will be forgiven. Who's going to represent you? Jesus represents you. The best lawyer, best attorney that you have. You'll never lose. You'll never lose if you have Jesus on your side. My little children wrote John in yet another message of entreaty. These things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. What's the advocate's name? Jesus Christ is the advocate. Jesus Christ what? The righteous, not the unrighteous. If you sin, you go to Jesus in the most holy. By faith you go in and say, Lord, have mercy. This very day Jesus is pleading his merits on behalf of his faithful children. And he says, my blood, Father, my blood. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant, then raised his hands and with a loud voice, deep pity cried, my blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God, who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with and I saw an angel with a throne, what is it, with a commission from Jesus, swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth, and waving something up and down in his hand, and crying with a loud voice, hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Yes, a, the sealing is coming to an end. The angels are holding back the winds of strife, and Jesus is raising his hands. Father, my blood, my blood, my blood, my blood. Wonderful. My blood, my blood, my blood. The devil comes, yes. Look at the sins that Brother Johnson has committed. Or Sister Lowe, or whoever it may be. Sister Deering. Jesus says, yes. Sister Deering committed all of these sins. And Brother Deering has committed these sins. He admits it but I have the right, the authority, through the blood that was shed on Calvary to forgive Brother Deering, Sister Deering, Sister Lowe, whoever it may be. I have that right. It's Jesus is going to save you. But you have to go to him in your unrighteous condition. Jesus is he's between the Father and 
and man. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I hope in the final analysis, when Jesus speaks, that he will say, you are holy, you are righteous, rather than you are filthy, and be excluded from God's kingdom. The gates will be wide open, all 12 gates in the New Jerusalem. And Jesus will say, come. Come, come in. Court is over. You're innocent. Your sins have been blotted out. Come. And then you will meet Jesus face to face, your Redeemer, your friend. What will you say to Jesus when you meet him the first time? Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your love, for your grace. Thank you for the trials that I have gone through. They were hard trials. Lord, so many valleys I went through, so many dark tunnels, but you always held my hand and you took me, took me from the slavery of sin into the promised land. Yes, the verdict is going to be announced very soon. The hour of his judgment is come. Court is in session today. Some names are being cleared, others are being condemned today except Jesus as your personal savior he's an advocate he loves you doesn't he he died for you he wants to save you at this moment confess your sins like Charles Finney did Jesus will forgive Jesus will defend you he will win your case may God help each one of us that we will be Christ-centered and someday we will all be transported to that heavenly paradise. I hope none of us will be left behind. May God be with you, my dear brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen.